This presentation provides an overview and summary of the in-person charrette that took place in Miami from November 14th through 18th, 2022 for the Miami-Dade Back Bay Coastal Storm Risk Management Feasibility Study. My name is Justine Woodward with the Army Corps of Engineers Norfolk District, and I am the Environmental Technical Lead for this study. I will be providing the narration for this presentation. The Miami-Dade Back Bay Coastal Storm Risk Management Feasibility Study was reinitiated on August 3, 2022. The purpose of this study is to reduce coastal storm risk in Miami-Dade County through the implementation of coastal storm risk management measures designed to reduce potential damage caused by coastal storms, including preventing loss of human life. During this first 12 months, the Norfolk District and Miami-Dade County will be formulating a new alternative that is economically justified, feasible to construct from an engineering perspective, acceptable to the county and stakeholders, and that is also acceptable from an environmental perspective. This may include refining and or adapting the measures in the 2021 recommended plan that did not have stakeholder support. The first half of the presentation provides an overview of each day's activities during the charrette and also presents some of the questions that charrette participants were provided and which encouraged the working group discussions. This overview will help set the stage for the second part of the presentation, which will include a summary of the alternatives that were developed over the course of the week. A substantial amount of planning and coordination was conducted by the Norfolk District, Miami-Dade County, and the City of Miami, which enabled the charrette to be a success. We had great participation and engaging dialogue throughout the course of the week with more than 80 participants. The majority of individuals participated in person. However, there was also virtual participation during the Monday and Friday sessions. The Monday afternoon session kicked off with remarks from Colonel Hallberg and Michelle Hamer, Chief of the Planning and Policy Division on behalf of the Corps of Engineers Norfolk District, and Jim Murley, Chief Resilience Officer for Miami-Dade County, as well as Mayor Kava, whom we heard from a little bit later during the afternoon. We reviewed the problems, opportunities, objectives, and constraints for the study, which are provided on a later slide in this presentation. Monday afternoon also consisted of presentations from the Corps of Engineers Jacksonville District on some of the other projects and studies occurring in the Miami-Dade County area. Lastly, Burton Studell with the Corps Engineering Research and Development Center gave a presentation on engineering with nature. The afternoon concluded with a group discussion that focused on residual risk, a general conversation about incorporating more natural and nature-based features or NNBFs, and comprehensive benefits. In referring to comprehensive benefits, this includes a more comprehensive approach to considering benefits to include social and environmental benefits in addition to national economic benefits. On Monday evening, an in-person public meeting was held from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Miami-Dade College Wolfson Campus building. Not counting Corps of Engineers and Miami-Dade County staff, we had 23 participants from the public sign in. The public meeting was an open house format and also included a brief presentation and question and answer session during the open house. An online public comment tool will remain open and accessible for the public to use for commenting on this study. Comments that have been entered on the site are available for anyone to view while accessing the website. To provide a snapshot of some comments received, a few comments are listed on this slide. Those comments include looking at the South Florida Water Management District's canal structures for opportunities to also use these structures as flood barriers. The use of temporary barriers to protect vulnerable coastal areas open space and park areas to serve as stormwater retention areas, and a recommendation to consider breakwater features within Biscayne Bay to attenuate storm surge and also provide environmental benefits. Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday consisted of two sessions each day. Half of the day was spent conducting site visits and the other half of the day participants conducted a working group session. 
The site visits were conducted for the purposes of gathering information and making observations, and using this information to inform the working group sessions. On Tuesday, the morning site visit consisted of a boat tour of the Miami River. Charette participants departed Bayside Marketplace and passed downtown Miami and Brickell Key before heading up the Miami River. As you can see in these photos, conventional shoreline structures were observed, including steel and concrete sheet pile walls. As noted here, the width of the Miami River varies anywhere from 90 to 150 feet, with navigational channel depths of 15 feet. Large freighters were also observed docked along the shoreline. This slide, along with the next two slides, were provided by Burton Sudell. Burton noted several observations that are included on these slides. Here, that includes wider sections of the Miami River may offer opportunities to incorporate natural and nature-based features, or NNBFs, into river shoreline designs. This slide also shows different riverbank designs that incorporate NNBFs and that were observed on the boat tour. The picture on the left depicts a shoreline that integrates the boardwalk with other features, such as native plant beds, into a flood protection system that reduces flood risk to the building in the background. This design retains the recreational value of boat docking capability along the waterfront. In the picture on the right, the park includes an earthen flood wall feature that offers flood retention capability when the bank is overtopped. These pictures were taken at Jose Marti Park, which also served as the site location for the afternoon working session. The pictures show the prefabricated concrete cells that function to reduce wave energy along the shoreline and also reduce bank erosion. Also noted here is that extending the blocks underwater could also provide additional substrate habitat. Tuesday's afternoon session focused on the Miami River and structural measures. Sonia Brubaker, Chief Resilience Officer for the City of Miami, provided a pr brief presentation and highlighted the city's prioritization of equitable investments. A handout was provided to all Charette participants that identified the city's priority stormwater projects. The list of questions that were provided to participants focused on social vulnerability, structural and nature-based solutions, and non-structural measures. Some of those questions are shown on this slide. These questions fueled the afternoon's discussions and recommendations that were presented at the end of the working group session that day. Tuesday was the first day participants broke out into pre-assigned groups or tables during the working session. Charette participants were collectively tasked with each group or table developing a new alternative by the end of the week. As you will see later in the presentation, the week concluded with eight different alternatives. There were varying levels of participation each day, but overall the groups remained largely the same for the duration of the week. Each group or table was assigned a facilitator and note taker, and there were staff from the Corps of Engineers and Miami-Dade County represented at each table. With structural measures being a large part of Tuesday's discussion, Norfolk District staff presented the concept of a bin wall before participants broke off into working groups. The bin wall concept is shown here on this slide. This is from the Norfolk Coastal Storm Risk Management Project in Virginia. The concept of a bin wall provides an opportunity to serve more than one purpose. Not only does it provide coastal storm damage reduction, but it can also provide usable recreational or gathering space. A bin wall can provide a walkable surface, eliminate the need for back battered piles, help with barge impacts, and can help break down the height of the wall from a pedestrian scale. The focus of day three was the Miami Shores area and non-structural measures. The day began with a bus tour of the Miami Shores area, including areas along the route of the flood wall proposed in the 2021 recommended plan. Charette participants stopped to visit the South Florida Water Management District's S27 water control structure located along the C7 Canal. 
participants heard from district staff the importance of maintaining the level of service and the need for implementing flood risk reduction measures and other associated improvements necessary to maintain level of service. During the discussion while on site, Miami-Dade County staff discussed adaptation action areas. These areas are planning tools that allow the county to work with community members to create adaptation plans for a focus area and facilitate the coordination of projects in that area. Water quality challenges were also discussed while on site and Manatee Critical Habitat was noted. The focus for the afternoon session on Wednesday was on non-structural measures. Some of the questions considered in the discussion are shown here on this slide. The Justice 40 initiative is a national commitment to environmental justice. It is a goal of the federal government that 40% of the benefits of federal investments should prioritize disadvantaged communities. The two images at the bottom depicted on this slide show the alignment of the proposed flood wall as part of the 2021 recommended plan. The image at the top focused in on Miami Shores and also shows, shows the golf course, which was a topic of discussion on this particular day. During Wednesday's afternoon discussion, concerns, challenges, and benefits of non-structural measures were discussed. A few of those concerns and challenges are shown here and include the lengthy time for widespread implementation, questions around how effective a program for residential elevations would be, concerns with still affecting community cohesion in terms of some homes being elevated and others not. The benefits of elevations may include working to maintain community cohesion if widely implemented and even potentially improving quality of life. On Thursday, the working session was conducted in the morning and the site visit occurred in the afternoon. Group discussions focused on the potential for other areas where NNBFs could be considered within the seven focus areas. Many groups focused on the importance of integrating the numerous Army Corps of Engineers projects and or studies and expanding the natural and nature-based feature proposed in the 2021 recommended plan to also include backfilling the mosquito ditches to reduce storm surge channeling through the ditches. On Thursday afternoon, participants toured an existing restoration site located on property owned by the town of Cutler Bay, adjacent to Southwest 184th Street and Old Cutler Road. This was followed by a second stop along Coral Gables Waterway, adjacent to Cocoa Plum Circle, where a gate is currently proposed as part of the 2021 recommended plan. On Friday morning, the charrette concluded with a brief wrap-up presentation and summary of the week followed by presentations from each of the eight groups. Each group was asked to describe or summarize their alternative to the public and consider how the alternative would serve environmental justice communities, and lastly, how the alternative addresses the study authority and the problems, opportunities, objectives, and constraints as shown here on this slide. The next half of the presentation is to summarize the key takeaways from the eight different alternatives. As I mentioned earlier, beginning on Tuesday, charrette participants were assigned to groups with a goal of each group developing a new alternative by the end of the week. For the most part, the partici participants at each table stayed the same. There may have been some degree of variation at each table because we had varying levels of participation throughout the week. For example, some participants only came on Tuesday. It is also worth noting that one new group, Table 8, formed on Thursday. At the end of the working session each day, an hour was reserved for report outs, and during this time, each group presented their recommendations. During the Friday session, each group was asked to provide an overall summary of their alternative and how they would present it to the public. As you will see on the next slides, the main messages for each group have been captured as well as visuals of the sketches and concepts developed during the week. Please note that charrette participants did have some fun during the week, and each group was asked to come up with a name for their alternative, as shown on the slides. I also wanted to acknowledge that there is a lot of information on each of these slides, and not every bullet point or paragraph will be read out loud. 
Pictures of the concepts drawn throughout the week are also shown, and in some cases, they may be a little bit difficult to read. In developing this presentation, our team wanted to provide a comprehensive summary of the week itself and of the information we gleaned from each table in terms of the alternatives. Before we jump into the alternatives presented from each group, I would like to provide a summary of the main themes captured throughout the week. First of all, several groups recommended a systems-wide approach to addressing coastal storm risk management with multiple layers of protection and adaptive solutions. From a geographical perspective, several groups mentioned the importance of starting with the barrier islands or even offshore with measures that would be considered a first line of defense against storm surge, such as enhancing or creating coral reefs to begin attenuating wave energy. Moving westward into Biscayne Bay, the next layer of protection would potentially include enhancing the existing man-made islands or the creation of new islands or the potential for a breakwater system, and then continuing with additional protective measures along the shoreline. There were recommendations made for elements to be adaptable over time, with both with respect to proposed nature-based solutions and structural solutions designed with the ability to be enhanced in the future as conditions continue to change. Coastal storm risk management solutions must address social equity and provide benefits to the most vulnerable populations in Miami-Dade County. Solutions should maintain or foster community cohesion and not divide communities, and the solutions should incorporate environmental benefits, such as improvements to water quality. Community engagement and involvement is absolutely necessary throughout this process. Numerous groups recommended the importance of renderings and conceptual drawings to convey the message. Residual risk was also a frequent topic of discussion this week. What level of protection is acceptable to the community and to stakeholders? Hybrid solutions were discussed, including how elements of structural, non-structural, and natural and nature-based features could be incorporated and where are they most appropriate. These hybrid solutions would also differ between the focus areas. Lastly, the importance of integration with other ongoing projects in the area was repeatedly discussed throughout the week. This, this includes not just other Army Corps of Engineer projects, but also the City of Miami's stormwater projects, as well as other ongoing projects and studies in the area. I will begin the summary of alternatives with table or group one. Group one developed a holistic or comprehensive approach to mitigating coastal storm surge through multiple lines of protection or defense strategy that would begin with slowing wave energy offshore, creating or enhancing natural barriers for protection, such as using living shorelines, holding the line, or potentially considering revising ordinances to require higher seawalls. And lastly, managed retreat to turn existing repetitive loss areas into green space and water storage retention areas, and also non-structural options to protect critical infrastructure. This group also discussed uh, equitable solutions for vulnerable inland communities through the use of historical water pathways and water conveyance to areas for storage treatment and cleaning. The use of canals as storage for coastal storm surge events, which would thereby overall reduce flood risk and would result in water being treated prior to release back into the bay. Group one emphasized consideration for storm time or duration factors and for planning horizons with the implementation of a phased approach and also incorporating measures that could be adaptable over time. To build upon the general framework, Group 1 recommended developing hybrid solutions as part of the multiple lines of defense strategy. For example, constructing living shorelines could be done in conjunction with structural measures such as flood walls, but with lower wall heights. Group 1 participants agreed to consider a greater level of risk by designing to a 100-year storm in models instead of a 200-year storm, which would also allow wall heights to decrease slightly. 
In the Miami Shores area, Group 1 recommended that the flood wall alignment be relocated outside of the neighborhood where there is current opposition and along the shoreline. In the Miami River area, this group recommended con consideration for a levee where the northern section of the flood wall is proposed as part of the 2021 recommended plan. Group 1 also supported the concept of a bin wall. Some general notes for the Cutler Bay area from Group 1 include additional natural and nature-based features, including mangrove and wetland construction or restoration beyond the focus area, would also provide risk reduction to the Cutler Bay area. Group 1 also recommended consideration for raising Old Cutler Road in some areas. To further build upon the wetland discussion, Group 1 uh, discussed designing natural and nature-based features intentionally with the consideration of their hydrologic and salinity requirements or tolerances for, the, for their success in establishment and continued success as part of a thriving ecosystem. Group one also identified the opportunities that natural and nature-based features provide for edu educational programming and community engagement. Group one also reiterated as one of their main themes, the need for public engagement and feedback throughout the process and the importance of visualization tools or concepts to communicate with the public. The title for Group 2 captures the recommendations this group developed throughout the week. This includes the use of green spaces in existing vacant or unused lots as urban retention areas. This general concept would include the purchase of vacant and low-lying or high-risk areas for water storage and the conversion of these areas to stormwater parks. One of the unknowns that was, was identified with this concept is the community appetite for this in light of development pressure and that would largely depend on property ownership. Group two supported the incorporation of bin walls as a structural measure and part of a linear park. Group two had some general thoughts or ideas about connecting to the Biscayne Bay Southeastern Everglades Restoration Project or BBCR project and diverting surge and stormwater from Eastern areas to more Western areas. Another general concept discussed is whether the South Florida Water Management District's CNSF structures could be adapted or modified with features to also protect against storm surge. The rehabilitation concept would provide equity for members of the community that couldn't get over the financial hurdle to relocate or elevate. The idea proposed by Group 2 is a home rehabilitation program and the question they asked was whether or not the county could expand an existing program to include home rehabilitation for flood mitigation. Similar to Group 1, Group 2 focused on the concept of multiple lines of defense and protection, particularly for the Cutler Bay area. The first line of defense would be expanding proposed mangrove and coastal marsh restoration. The second line of defense would include raised levees or possibly levee reinforcement and enhancement of these areas for recreational use with pedestrian or bike access. You can see from the concept drawing here that this team supported an engineering with nature solution focused mindset and also considered the use of native vegetation to enhance habitat and provide shade which would also protect economic livelihoods and freshwater resources. Group three discussed the incorporation of more natural and nature-based features into the project. This group identified the use of green roadways for drainage and protection and the benefits of connecting green streets to parks, which can be made floodable and serve as storm or floodwater storage areas. Bioswales with shrubs, grasses, and trees would also provide water storage and additional benefits, and trees would help to mitigate the heat island effect. Group three presented the idea of floating or new man-made islands to act as a potential barrier. 
the new man-made island concept would consist of strategically constructed islands staggered for more effective use. The benefits of these islands would include wave attenuation, potential beneficial reuse of dredge material, and it was also suggested that the islands could serve as a location for a structural measure to also attenuate wave action. Co-benefits of the additional man-made islands would include creation of habitat and new recreational areas, as well as carbon sequestration. In the Miami Shores area, this group discussed a linear raised park or levee along the corridor of the proposed alignment from the 2021 recommended plan in lieu of a flood wall and the creation of elevated green space. Adjustments to the alignment could be made if need be. Group three recommended that a structural solution be incorporated due to the magnitude of potential impacts of non-structural measures. The more this group discussed non-structural measures, the more this group realized that the structural measures made more sense and that it just needed to be refined and rebranded. If non-structural measures are to be incorporated, then additional pump stations would be needed to get the water out. But as this group articulated, the water has to go elsewhere, but identifying where that would be is challenging. Also, the potential implementation of managed retreat for water storage was discussed. Group four also focused on the theme of multiple lines of defense with the first line of defense against coastal storms beginning with the dune and beach system of the barrier islands. Group four considered segmented living breakwaters in Biscayne Bay as a secondary line of defense that would attenuate wave action and provide protection from coastal storm surges. With multiple lines of defense, consideration could then be given to reducing wall heights of the structural measures. Group four discussed the potential for natural and nature-based features in inland areas with connectivity to the waterfront for example, such as along canals, and the need to balance protection from coastal storm surge and community preservation. Group four identified a need to investigate solutions for the areas most highly impacted and discussed ways to live with water without floodgates and structural measures. Lastly, participants from group four agreed that the community wants to see renderings of as much as possible. This slide captures the overarching themes and messages from group five, and more details are provided in the subsequent slides. Group five's alternative would utilize the aquatic preserve as a nature-based solution and incorporate natural and nature-based features wherever and whenever practicable. This group acknowledged the following, the need for trade-offs to achieve the greatest flood protection, the need to exhaust all features and measure options before deciding on a new alternative measure for each focus area. A series of measures may be more effective in a given focus area. And lastly, another common theme that we have heard repeatedly is the importance of landscape architecture drawings and renderings to communicate intent. Group five also identified the need to integrate Corps of Engineer, city and county projects to achieve larger scale project successes. Hybrid infrastructure measures offer low hanging fruit due to plentiful existing infrastructure. Transport of Everglades freshwater from west to east is an essential element of project success. Canals offer excellent opportunities to serve as multi-purpose structures beyond mere water conveyances. Lastly, Group 5 recommended considering and embracing a changing landscape, both from climate and community perspectives. Group 5 in particular developed multiple renderings throughout the week. This is a concept designed by Sonia Chow showing the multiple lines of defense that include enhancing existing coral reefs, the barrier islands, and the existing man-made islands in Biscayne Bay. The transfer of development right concept was also discussed by this group. The premise of this being to provide greater incentives to facilitate buyouts of real estate 
in areas of highest vulnerability and then set aside the purchased lots to create a series of water retention areas. This slide depicts two different concepts developed by Table 5 participants. Concept 1A reflects a modified bin wall design. Bin wall design is ripe for innovation, such as the incorporation of natural and nature-based features on the landward and seaward side. Concept 1B to the right shows multiple measures that could be incorporated into the Bayfront and Museum Park areas. This concept also includes elevating Biscayne Boulevard. The current slide identifies areas where the 1B concept drawing from the previous slide could be applied in the Bayfront Park, Dan Paul Plaza, and Museum Park areas. The concepts on this slide were contributed by Trevor Dover of Group 5, and they depict the Bayfront and Museum Park areas before and after natural and nature-based features are incorporated into the coastal storm risk management designs in these areas. Additionally, land side of a living seawall type structure could also include a horizontal levee to aid water retention, native vegetation, and recreational amenities. The current slide depicts a conceptual drawing of a sector gate with natural and nature-based features incorporated. Opportunities for incorporating, incorporating NNBFs alongside this structural measure could include texturing subaqueous areas with vertical habitat panels or above ground areas planted with native vegetation to increase habitat value and reduce maintenance. If a pump station was constructed in the water, the pilings could be lined with habitat panels to increase habitat value and also include the placement of artificial reefs to also improve habitat quality and reduce wave energy. Slide 29 presents a conceptual drawing from Group 5 of opportunities to improve water quality in the canals. In-water features might include strategically located treatment wetlands to improve habitat value, reduce erosion, trap sediments, and capture and remove nutrients from the water column. Slide 30 features a conceptual drawing that highlights the connectivity of the current Miami-Dade Back Bay project to the BBC or project and ongoing upland restoration efforts. Successful coastal storm risk management measures in this area could include ensuring freshwater flows from the BBC or project or Canal C100 to restore freshwater wetlands in the area and the backfilling of mosquito ditches to reduce storm surge that may channel through the ditches. Group 5 also proposed elevating portions of Cutler Road and raising the existing trail. Slide 31 depicts two concepts from Group 5. The concept drawing to the left is a cross section of the Cutler Bay wetlands depicting the transition from mangroves to coastal marsh, uplands, and the raised Cutler Trail. The concept to the right depicts a little more detail and identifies desired native species that could be utilized as part of the design and which would maximize coastal storm risk management value as nature engineers. Important to note is this group suggested incorporation of an elevated boardwalk that could extend into the marsh and serve as an educational trail for local residents. Lastly, slide 32 depicts two conceptual drawings showing re restoring overland flow of freshwater from the Everglades via surface canals to enhance coastal marshes in Cutler Bay via the BBC project. This would also help reduce saltwater intrusion.
Group 6 developed a general framework to address coastal storm surge risk by establishing a multi-layered redundant system through the use of mitigation or adaptation strategies to encourage equitable solutions through the pairing of natural and nature-based features with structural solutions. The adaptation strategies would be zone-specific. The team identified the concept of geographic zones while broadly describing the need for adaptation strategies for each zone. Zone 1 represents the area offshore of the Barrier Islands, Zone 2, the Barrier Islands, Zone 3, Biscayne Bay, Zone 4, shoreline areas, and Zone 5, inland areas, or productive landscapes and green space creation, with natural and nature-based features in inland areas to include recreational opportunities for vulnerable communities, particularly in highly impacted areas. Group 6 emphasized balancing protection with preservation of character of existing communities and neighborhoods. In the Cutler Bay area, Group 6 proposed filling the existing mosquito ditches and planting or restoring additional mangroves to prevent storm surge channeling through the ditches. Group 6 recommended raising the existing levee to tie into sections of Old Cutler Road and the integration of a levee solution with natural and nature-based features to create a continuous levee where feasible. Group 6 also recommended considering increasing the height of the existing 87th Avenue levee. Group 7 considered the possibility of multiple storm surge barriers, including barriers at Hallover Inlet, and government cut. The storm surge barriers would provide protection to the upper bay and tie into the structural measures at the Miami River. One of the concepts from this group includes a levee to tie into the proposed sector gate just outside the mouth of the Miami River, as you can see in the concept drawing on this slide. Continued on this slide are some additional considerations from Group 7, which came out of Thursday's session in Cutler Bay. The additional considerations from this group include higher regulatory standards, the protection of open space, and the potential for buyback programs, the concept of multiple layers of protection, mangrove restoration and construction, barrier island improvements, and living breakwaters. As mentioned earlier in the presentation, Group 8 formed on Thursday, and this slide captures the main takeaways developed by Group 8. Similar to other groups, this group identified the need for a hybrid plan with a layered approach and built-in system redundancies. The barrier islands would serve as a first line of defense, followed by natural and nature-based enhancements at the existing man-made islands. Group 8 determined the need for structural measures at Miami River, with further consideration being given to public access. Lastly, Group 8 focused on the need for inland water management or retention systems and the integration of these systems with other ongoing projects. The current slide is the same as slide 16 and captures the main themes that came out of the charrette, which were reflected in the alternatives developed by each of the eight groups. Numerous groups recommended a system-wide approach to addressing coastal storm risk management with multiple layers of protection and adaptive solutions. From a geographical perspective, we heard from numerous groups the importance of starting with the barrier islands or even offshore with measures that would be considered a first line of defense against storm surge. In Biscayne Bay, consideration should be given to enhancing the existing man-made islands or the creation of new islands or the potential for breakwater systems, and then continuing with measures along the shoreline and further inland. We heard teams recommend a phased implementation approach that allows for some of the elements to be adaptable over time, both with respect to proposed nature-based solutions and structural solutions designed with the ability to be enhanced in the future. Coastal storm risk management solutions must address social equity and provide benefits to the most vulnerable populations in Miami-Dade County. 
Solutions should maintain or foster community cohesion and to not divide communities, and the solutions should incorporate environmental benefits, such as improvements to water quality, which we can all agree is a big challenge. Community engagement and involvement is absolutely necessary throughout this process. Numerous groups recommended the importance of renderings and conceptual drawings to convey the message. And in terms of residual risk, what level of protection is acceptable to the communities and stakeholders? How can elements of structural, non-structural, and natural and nature-based features be incorporated into hybrid solutions and where are they most appropriate? And lastly, repeated throughout the week, we heard the importance of integration with other ongoing projects in the Miami-Dade area, uh, including not just other Corps of Engineer projects, but also the city's stormwater projects and other ongoing projects and studies. The last slide of this presentation identifies additional public engagement opportunities in the near future. The Norfolk District will continue to work with Miami-Dade County to further refine the alternatives from the charrette to a selection of measures that would be incorporated into the new alternative moving forward. This concludes the summary presentation of the in-person charrette that took place from November 14th through the 18th of 2022 for the Miami-Dade Back Bay Coastal Storm Risk Management Feasibility Study.